we spend so much time working if this is not something that brings us joy then we should either change the work we are doing or go find something else to do uh thank you so much for joining today we are very excited you know all of us in this country and me as a woman and a lot of women in the country all of us look up to you you are one of the iconic leaders we've had in india with your phenomenal turn around for the brand britannia and all that you've done and it's a, such an honor to be talking to you today vinita i'm going to jump into a quote that you said which is so relevant in uh, today's context you said leader must lead by example and with empathy you can bring a lot more out of people when you inspire them people will follow you more out of inspiration than fear how should leaders entrepreneurs startup founders everyone look at empathy wow that's a big question so first of all <laughs> shraddha let me start by thanking you for this wonderful opportunity to be in this conversation with you, thank you. and i think explore some of these critical uh, concepts that you have uh, brought forward so i think empathy we a lot of people have a lot of perceptions around what empathy is but according to me empathy is the ability to go outside of yourself to go into a situation that someone else is in and look at it from that perspective or understand it from that point of view very often we rely on our own mental models and sometimes mental models are great because they get you where you want to very quickly at other times mental models are actually a hindrance because they color the way you look at a situation empathy is about understanding empathy is has no judgment in it so the whole idea behind empathy is i must first understand the situation as it is for the people who are impacted by it before i can come with a solution or an inference or a point of view around it and as you said it's not that the world needs empathy now i think if we lived in an empathetic world and i want to take it beyond how people react with other people empathy also is that i don't go and cut down a tree just because the tree cannot speak empathy also is that i don't mistreat animals on the road how many times we've seen people taking up a stone and throwing it at a dog because they want yeah. the dog to run away so empathy is larger than just the relationship between individuals it is our entire relationship with the environment why are we struggling with the whole question of climate change which half the people are not even recognizing as being real we are yeah. struggling with it because over a period of time we believe that we can control the environment rather than learn to live with the environment today a lot of leaders a lot of entrepreneurs all of us are looking at scale all of us are looking at growth all of us are looking at building large businesses what are some of the things if you have to say uh, from your journey that you did in a certain way which led to great outcomes which you know as people as as entrepreneurs we should remember like these are two three things that you should do while you are building or looking at scale so uh, shraddha again i think we keep talking about britannia because obviously britannia is a brand and a company in india and therefore it is best known but at the risk of sounding a little immodest let me also say that when i was the global marketing director for brand cook uh, yeah. which is my responsibility was marketing for brand cook around the world we actually doubled its growth trajectory from a volume growth of 3.5% to 7% and this is wow. fairly well documented and it's it's in several books and so on and i had this a similar experience when i worked with cadbury's in south africa you know i went to south africa in 93 i was the first professional from india 
to go to work in South Africa. I used to work for Cadbury at that time. And because South Africa, because of its policy of apartheid, etc., not many people had, or many companies had focused on it, it was a great opportunity to again change the trajectory of the business. So Britannia was one more, in a sense, <laughs> uh, within that. But the reason why I'm mentioning more than just Britannia is because I want to draw a line of similarity which stretches across all of these. It doesn't matter whether it is a global brand like Coke or a local brand like Britannia. I think at the end of the day, businesses have to remember one thing that, you know, everything that the business gets starting with revenue and ending depending on your business model with the bottom line really is a question of your ability to serve your consumer better than anybody else. Yeah. We are not in business to prove that we are better than competition. We are in business to serve the consumer or the customer. And those brands, those organizations that do this and do it consistently and do it better than others are the winners. And we have seen there are so many brands that we experience in our everyday lives that are more than 100 years old. Britannia is more than 100 years old. There is Coca-Cola, there's IBM, there are, there are many brands around the world that have demonstrated over a period of time their ability, Procter & Gamble, Unilever, yeah. Coke, etc. So those brands that consistently invest in understanding the consumer. Coming back to where we started, empathy. If I can empathize with what my consumers want, I can create, I can innovate, I can give them not just what they want, but surprise them and delight them by giving them more than what they want. I cannot get there without understanding what their needs are and how my product or my service or a combination of product and service can actually meet those needs better than anybody else. So the definition of business is that you have to have a customer. I cannot be in business if I am not surprising and delighting my customers and giving them value for in exchange of their hard earned money. So the common thread through all my examples from Cadbury to Coke to Britannia really was, we said, we, the focus is single-mindedly on the consumer. The focus is single-mindedly on creating a business model and a commercial model that enables us to best uh, reach out to the consumer, to delight and surprise the consumer better than anybody else, and do it in a manner which generates enough profit for all stakeholders. So there is an understanding of what the market is, what the opportunity in the market is. And I'm giving you a very long answer, but I do want to talk about one other thing, which for me was a big learning. And I mm. kind of chanced upon this. You know, when marketers get together, they talk about let's segment the market. And my insight was, it's not about segmenting the market. It's about segmenting the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Because segmenting the market means I take what exists and I divide it in some manner so that there are homogeneous segments that I can reach to with my go-to-market strategy or business model. Segmenting the opportunity says I am going to go and find those opportunities where the consumer is not consuming my product today. So something yeah. that we did very simply in Britannia was how do we change our packaging? So biscuits move from remaining only a grocery item that if I'm a teenager, my mother buys so that I can consume at home to something that I can consume on the go. And the inspiration was from my time in Cadbury's, you know, where you had what we call self-consumption packs, on-the-go packs. I buy a packet of biscuits. It has three biscuits. I can eat it whether I'm traveling by bus or by plane or by train. So I think those are some of the opportunities that entrepreneurs have to remember. So there are two key things I'm saying. One is 
a great understanding of the consumer. The second is three things I'm saying. The second is the ability to segment the opportunity. And the third is to come, with a, come up with a business model that enables you to do this consistently and sustainably whilst generating enough profit for all stakeholders. Recently, I spoke to Mr. Ratan Tata and he had a very interesting point. Don't look at only maximizing the shareholder value, but look at all the stakeholders. And, and I think in your journey, you have been very uh, cognizant, very aware, and, and you've done that. And there's so many things that you've done to take care of the whole stakeholder uh, value. Because he said that if you take care of the stakeholders' value, then shareholders, one should not, like, you know, you shouldn't just optimize for shareholders. In today's world, and especially I'm talking of the startup and the, uh, the entrepreneurial world, where funding and raising valuations and, and, and you know, maximizing and building for returns is the very, very, very strong narrative. How do you think that entrepreneurs and leaders should be looking at stakeholders' value? By the way, I fully believe in the concept of stakeholders as you described, Mr. Tata, say, which is why even in my previous response to you, I think I used the word stakeholder. And not yes, stakeholder. yes. I picked my question from there. <laughs> you know, so uh, the thing is, we have to recognize that even if you have a big business, the most successful business, that business is part of an ecosystem, of a larger ecosystem. And we are all directly or indirectly connected to that ecosystem. In fact, COVID has proven that we are directly connected to that ecosystem. So, you know, none of us can escape. Maybe we can escape temporarily, but not forever. Yeah. So stakeholders become really important because if you start with the notion that I am creating a business, whether I'm a startup or a hundred year old company, we have to prove that we are relevant. We have to prove that we give the best value every day. Just because you've been around for 100 years doesn't give you any legitimacy to be around for another 100 years. You've got to be doing everything right. In fact, we used to say in the Coca-Cola company that in a consumer democracy, consumers are voting for you, your brand, and your business every day. They can make it or they can break it. So the question really is, if you are in business for the long haul, not to make a quick buck and then disappear into the ether somewhere, if the whole idea of a business is that it is there to stay because it brings value to a large number of stakeholders, then it stands to reason that you cannot do one at the cost of another. I cannot say that let me generate returns for my shareholders by really paying my employees very little salary. Because tomorrow, those employees will not want to work for you. Somebody else will come along and they'll go away. I'm talking about you know, a normal, vibrant kind of a world that hopefully we will get to inhabit again very soon. So the question is, it's very short-sighted to say that I can rob Peter to pay Paul and still run a wonderful business. Yeah. At the end of the day, you know, you started your first question was also about inspiration, motivation. The people you want most inspired and motivated in an organization are your employees, because if they are happy, if they are working joyfully, they will create those wonderful experiences for your customers. Think of uh, the everyday things that we do. When there is joy in what we do, it doesn't feel like work. You know, as somebody said, uh, take up something that you like to do and you wouldn't have to work a single day in your life. Yeah. I think it's a little bit like that. And unless we've got the economic interest of all the stakeholders, I am very clear that you cannot sustain a business. You may be able to sustain it for a short period of time, but you cannot sustain it for a long period of time. Since you mentioned the Tatas, I remember being, you know, reading this as a student somewhere. I think it was someone who asked Mr. Jamshed Ji Tata, you know, what is, uh, what is good for the Tatas? And he at that time said, and I think it, it just 
distills the core essence. He said, what is good for India is good for Tata's. Wow. And I think that really sums up what is the starting point? Are you thinking about the larger ecosystem or are you just thinking about your tiny little business and saying, when will I get a valuation? When will I become a unicorn and so on? If we have to, you know, do consistently well in our career, like the way you have done, what are some of the things you will share with us generously? Oh, I'll share everything I know uh, <laughs> generously. So, um, you know, whilst I have, um, whilst I've, I think, you know, done everything I wanted to do, I never really had a plan for myself which says, you know, by this time I want to be this and by that time I want to be that. And my own learning and insight from that and therefore my conviction because it has worked for me is that do what you like to do do it sincerely there's a lot of hard work it's not about you got lucky and you had all these breaks and opportunities I could have said no to the breaks and opportunities that came my way but temperamentally I'm the kind of person who likes adventure temperamentally I'm the kind of person who likes to explore Temperamentally, I'm the kind of person who's not great at status quo. There are many people who will come and, you know, they'll make sure that nothing goes awry, but nothing is spectacular either. So I think the first thing we have to recognize is what do we like to do? Because mm. if we like to do something, we will get good at it. If I don't like to do something, there's no way I can really excel. So I think an understanding of what excites you, what motivates you, what inspires you, what you want to do for yourself is very, very important. The second thing I would say is treat all opportunities seriously. I had mm. many opportunities that came my way. Many I said yes to and some that I said no to. I don't regret the ones I said no to but I definitely love the ones I said yes to because they gave me an exposure. They gave me a perspective. They gave me a dimension, which I would not have imagined if somebody had asked me when I was a student uh, that do you think you would you know, live and work in six countries and five continents and have the opportunity to travel and work in 70 other countries? I would have said, you know, this, this is a joke. <laughs> But actually it happened yeah. and it didn't happen suddenly. One thing led to another. So coming back to uh, answering your question specifically, the first is I think we just have to know ourselves. The second is to consider all opportunities and not to say yes, because it will look very great to everybody else. If it doesn't look great to you, it doesn't matter what it looks like to anyone else. Because again, I would give you a quote from this wonderful book that we read as students in school, which was To Kill a Mockingbird. Mm. And in that, there is one sentence where he says that before you learn to live with others, you've got to learn to live with yourself. So I think knowing yourself and what you like to do is very important. Third is don't be afraid to experiment. Somehow I've come across a lot of people who feel that failure in business is not a good thing or, you know, it's not something that we should talk about. And I'm very amused at that for the simple reason that, you know, when we think about people in sports, the yeah. tennis states, uh, has Federer only won matches and Grand Slam titles? Has he not lost anything? So one, one um, uh, you know, Grand Slam doesn't make or break your career. Your career is a collection of everything that you've done over a period of years and the consistency with which you've done it. So the third really is experiment. Don't be afraid. Fourth is you have to have some conviction in yourself. By that, I don't mean we, you know, we tend to overestimate our abilities and so on. Uh, but I think having some conviction in yourself certainly helps. 
The next is the ability to be a perennial student mm. and learn from everything. I think curiosity is a wonderful thing. If you're curious about how things work, how businesses work, then you will keep yourself refreshed all the time. And last but not least is what I call character and work ethic. Uh, you know, how do you prioritize what you do? Uh, what is in and what is out? How do you make decisions? These are not things that somebody has to tell you. These are things that you uh, do because you believe in them. Um, these are things that you do because these are the right things to do. These are things that you do because ethically, that is the way to be, not just legally. I've been in several meetings where people say, but you know, if legally this is tenable, it's fine. And my way of thinking is just because it's legally all right, doesn't make it ethically. I don't like to use the word morally because it sounds very judgmental. But, you know, ethics, business ethics, operating yeah. with honesty, operating with integrity, those can never be compromised. Because once you start compromising those, then there is no end. So, and finally, finally, we spend so much time working. If this is not something that brings us joy, then we should either change <laughs> the work we are doing or go find something else to do. I heard you recently uh, talking about this when we had the panel. You know, the discussion was that COVID and brings uh, opportunities for women because now they're working from home. So we will see more women coming in the workforce. And you said it's too simplistic and naive. <laughs> and that was the, the topic given. And you started bang on by saying it's too simplistic and naive to say that COVID brings opportunity and we'll see more women working from home. How will we see more women in the workforce? Because the numbers are just going down. And honestly, uh, Shraddha, that bothers me as well. It also bothers me that when you look at numbers of uh, women who are entering IIMs, for example, uh, this year, in the several of the top IIMs, it's the proportion is lower than what it was the year before. So I think as a society, we have to sit back and say, why is this happening? Forget about women in managerial positions or in the corporate world. Women's participation in paid labor, because women are working all the time. I mean, yeah. I know no woman who's not a working woman, except yeah. that she's doing a lot of work in the house for which she does not get remunerated. So the participation of women overall is down to 26%, which I think has to be unacceptable, uh, you know, from the point of view of equity and fairness. Yeah. So there are this is a many layered topic and we have to ask questions at various levels. Yeah. The family environment in which boys and girls grow up, the conditioning that you get from your parents, relatives, the larger community and ecosystem, what we are taught in schools, the, the encouragement that girls are given, Somehow when girls do well, there is always a story behind it because there is an encouraging dad. You remember, I think I'd also said that we need some Renaissance men. We need some <laughs> yeah. dads. You know, men who will say, I am not differentiating between my son and my daughter. I am differentiating between what talent they have, what competency they have. If my daughter is better at doing something and my son is better at doing something else, I want to give them those equal opportunities. Because I think that is what we owe to our children. We yeah. cannot decide that you should do this and you should do that. And yet that is what is happening. And when I say we, most of the, those decisions are made by men in positions of power and authority and position. So it is a big change. It is a big change that has social dimensions. It is a big change that has economic dimensions. It is a big change that needs to start in the workplace. So we can't do all of the above. So let's come back to this whole thing about, you know, wow, COVID 
and work from home is the answer. We can now increase gender diversity. <laughs> because guess what? We'll get all the women to work from home. I mean, I'm exaggerating to make the point. And I think we are missing the point. Yeah. We are missing the point. We are making so many assumptions. The first assumption, which is also not fair to the men, is that, you know, it's only the women who require flexibility and not the men. I mean, if I am the kind of person you tell me you work from home, I'm responsible for an output, I would love to go and play my game of golf at some stage, come back and still finish my work. I want that flexibility. So it's not that women need the flexibility and men don't. And when we say women need that flexibility, how many women have we gone and spoken to? I have, you know, after this and even before that, spoken to a lot of women. And it's not easy for them to work from home. Yeah. There are so many factors. We are also assuming that most homes have enough space to separate your personal space from your workspace. That is not true. Yeah. The large number of people, if you look at IT, if you look at other shared services, etc., we are talking about the median age being 26 to 30. Several of them are either still living with their parents or they're living as paying guests or they're living in shared accommodation or they're just starting out and therefore they've got small homes. There is no space to continually yeah. work from home. Today it is working in a COVID environment because there's no option. The moment you give me an option of always working from home or always working from the office, I think flexibility is different from work from home on a permanent basis. If you give both men and women the flexibility and say that in a month, you know, you can choose five days that you can work from home. And this is the way we are going to do it. That is very different. So let's not confuse flexibility with working from home as the panacea or the magic elixir that is going to solve all our problems of uh, diversity. Maybe we need to rethink the structure of these large offices where 6,000 people are working in a building. Maybe every organization needs smaller satellite offices where people don't have to travel more than 30 to 35 minutes to work. You know, work is also uh, has a social dimension. The fact that if you and I are colleagues, we're sitting down at lunch and we are sharing what we are doing, we are shooting the breeze as it were, we are coming up with new ideas and concepts. How is that going to happen in a uh, you know, work from home situation where we are only seeing each other on screen? So the whole, the whole question has many facets, many dimensions, many layers. Yeah. And that is why I said to say that work from home is going to be a big uh, factor that will contribute to keeping more women in the workplace and more diversity is, I think, uh, you know, uh, an assumption or a hypothesis that needs to be verified. Uh, because I don't think some of us can project um, our own experiences and say work from home is going to be uh, the answer. Today we are living in a world of social media, internet, where all of us have created, there are so many micro communities and, and we are all surrounding ourselves with the same kind of narrative or people, you know, we can relate to. How can we be aware that we are not becoming part of a narrative or getting influenced by a narrative, but how can we detach ourselves and be self-aware that these are the different voices, and which might not be same as mine or yours. Yeah, I think you raise a very, very important uh, point, which is really a sociological point as well. Whilst on the one hand, social media gives you this huge scale and visibility, you can decide what your digital footprint ought to be and you can tweet and you can Facebook and you can do all kinds of other things. And then find communities of interest, people who think more like you and so on. Because if you say something that other people don't like, I am not on any social media platform. <laughs> but I have 
enough friends who say, you know, I said this and then I was trolled and so on. And I'm saying, why do we want to put ourselves through this? I think the question is also a bigger question. Because social media allows stratification in so many ways, you can really, you know, cut and this is like Amazon does. I order a book and then it says, well, people like you also order these books. And yeah. I don't want anybody to tell me what books to order. But that is the price we pay. And that is the whole dimension of big data and AI and looking at patterns and so on. But coming back to the point, if we are going to, as a result of social media, end up narrow casting ourselves, rather than being broad based, then where are the alternate narratives? Where is the yeah. new thinking? Where is the new challenge going to come from? I remember Gandhiji saying that if you really want to understand another point of view, you have to learn to engage with that point of view, which is different from yours. Mm. That requires tremendous capacity, tremendous maturity, yeah. tremendous understanding and respect, because it is not an argument where you are going to win or I am going to win. It is an exploration. It is a dialogue where we are both enriching each other's points of view to hopefully come up with a point of view which is better than you know, ours separately. Yeah. So, so I think... When social media gets very, uh, what should I say, homogeneous, because yeah. I feel very comfortable in this group of people. We're all thinking about the same things. We all feel the similar way. It's all very nice and cuddly and warm and so on. Uh, what we are doing is we are excluding all other narratives yeah. from our being and uh, it might feel very reinforcing, but I think we are making little cocoons and not really facing the bigger reality, which is full of paradoxes. The bigger reality is full of contradictions. The bigger reality is full of multiple narratives. And in order to live with that bigger reality, we have to learn to engage with it. How do you look at life and living? Uh, and completely, holistically, not just as a professional, not just as a leader, not as a woman, but what keeps you going? What has anchored and how do you look at life? You know, for me, life is, um, first of all, life is an adventure and therefore has to be experienced in its many dimensions. A lot of people have also asked me this question about uh, work-life balance. And I find that a very interesting question because for me, work is a part of my life. My life is not a part of my work. So I think it just sets the context. I think I also grew up being exposed to many different things. My mother was very interested in the arts. So... I grew up surrounded by classical music and dance. And because of that, wonderful artists that I got to meet even as a child. And these were, you know, the all time greats from uh, uh, Ali Akbar Khanji to Ravi Shankar, Nikhil Banerjee, Girija Devi, Hira Bai Barodikar. And I mean, I can go on and on uh, because of my association with uh, you know, then school provided us a great environment for elocution and dramatics and sports. And, and I was one of those uh, students in school where I wanted to do everything. So I played mm -hmm. hockey and I did drama. And so I grew up surrounded by many dimensions. So studies and going to school was only one of the things I did. I did many more things. And fortunately, uh, I have managed to keep that interest alive right through my uh, working life, uh, if you would like to call the stage that we have been through and still are in. So uh, because I got a chance to live in so many different countries, I was fascinated by different cultures. The experience that my 
profession gave to me was an experience which was much larger than going and selling coke and chocolates and uh, you know to different consumers around the world it was about understanding different cultures it was about visiting their museums traveling a lot getting in all of those influences so i think there is so much to be experienced in this world like i had an american friend who once said to me now i know why indians believe in multiple births because you can't possibly absorb everything in one <laughs> life so i feel a little bit like that you know there is so much there is nature there is photography i'm very very influenced by art and culture in you know a capital a uh, this is a performing arts more uh, also some visual arts but uh, you know art theater is another fashion uh, you know classical music both western as well as indian so i am you know i worked and i experienced all of these even now you know in normal times i travel a lot so if i know i'm going to be in london on a particular day or in new york on a particular day i look up and i uh, you know i go to broadway or i go and see a theater or i go and listen to music because i think that's those are the multiple hues and dimensions of life which are there for us to experience and we can choose to experience them or not and my choice is to experience them